Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Newton Wellesley Medical Group, another edition of Lunch and Learn. Today, we're really excited to bring to everyone Alan Whitcower. Alan's going to be talking to us about, hey, doc, the pain is in my back, not in my head, behavioral medicine and low back pain. Next slide, please. Alan. Just to tease on next two weeks up, up uh, upcoming lunch and learns, we have a talk on female urinary incontinence. And then we will have uh, Leah Blackstone will be able to uh, give her talk that was supposed to happen a couple of weeks ago on data integrity. So we're excited about that. Those are questions when your patient wants you to change the record and when you should and when you shouldn't and what your responsibilities about the electronic health record. So we're excited about that talk. Um, we, uh, we do remind our folks that our, all our talks are up on YouTube and also on our intranet Newton. Next slide. Just a couple of programs we like to review. Uh, Newton Wellesley Hospital Spine Center is open and the Spine Center, which is where Alan works, and he, I'm sure he's going to be talking about that, can be reached at 243-5777. And it's a nice way to send your patients there. There's a navigator there who will tell you take your patients in and we'll tell them where, who they need to be seen, whether it's from a surgeon or a PMR doc or PT or a psychologist. Next slide. And then our wellness programs that we continue to promote, I think we're gonna be um, highlighting the one program, the Physician Care Concierge Program. Next slide. A concierge Program is uh, through Circles and you can just log on to community.circles.com, register with the welcome code NWH it is a service, a personal assistance program that's designed to give helping hand and advice when managing priorities personally and professionally. The assistance is completely free. They vet all their services and um, it's very easy to use. You just send an email with your question or your need and they send, it, they send a response fairly quickly with three different solutions. Next slide. And we've had over 122 registered users since we started using this program. And we estimate that a four hours saved per request four hours of your personal time given back to you for free. Um, 78 unique users and the NPS scores are off the charts as you can see. Next slide. And just to show you what kinds of things you might be thinking about for this, um, decor and party themes, finding a reputable dog walker, the best TV and internet suppliers. I've personally used it for um, home improvements and also home repairs. Uh, In-home tutoring, it says there, pet walking. Next slide. And the top 15 uh, flowers being the number one, of course, and gifts. Contractors being number three. Next slide. Snow removal is up there. Hope we don't have to worry about that for a few months. All right, well, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wickhauer. Thanks, Alan, for being here. Appreciate you being here. And um, I'll see you all at one o'clock. Thanks. Uh, well, John, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. And uh, thanks to everybody showing up on a, on a beautiful day like today. It's, it's really remarkable. So, uh, I hope this, this talk is going to be useful in your practice with your patients with low back pain. Uh, the title is, Hey Doc, the pain is in my back, not in my head. And this may be a phrase that's familiar to you with your patients. I know it is with, with our patients. So let me just uh, give you an overview of this talk. Uh, our behavioral medicine services uh, are integrated into our spine and pain management services, uh, which are located in the uh, Ambulatory Care Center at Wales Avenue in Newton. Our phone number is 617-243-6142. And if you want to place an order for a behavioral medicine consultation, you just uh, type in behavioral medicine and then uh, click on ambulatory referral to Newton Wellesley Behavioral Medicine. And that will then, uh, your patient will get uh, scheduled hopefully with either myself or my, my newest colleague, uh, Joshua Smith. Uh, Josh comes to us from the Beth Israel uh, Pain Management Center. He started with us back in March and already he's quite, quite booked. Um, in this talk, uh, the key points I wanna, I wanna make is when I think about behavioral medicine, I'm thinking about not just what uh, Josh and I do with the patients who have low back pain, but also behavioral medicine may actually start with your conversations with your patients. And if you and your patients are lucky, 
it may be that with your conversations, they may not end up needing to see one of us. And we'll talk a little bit about how that's possible. But in my consultations and in your conversations, if you have sufficient time, hopefully you'll be able to inquire with your patients, what are their fears? What are their beliefs? Uh, what are their expectations for their recovery from their, from their back pain? Uh, hopefully you or, or we will be able to help the patient understand that low back pain uh, can be influenced by um, or affected uh, by things like mood, activity, relationships, sleep, um, and have an impact on all those. And something that's really important, I think, to pay attention to um, is if you do decide to make a referral for a behavioral medicine consultation, if you don't want the patient looking at you and saying, hey, doc, but the, the pain's in my back, not in my head, then there are several principles that I'm going to talk about, about making a referral that's going to be successful, uh, making a referral where the patient actually shows up, in making a referral where the patient actually gets to benefit from that initial meeting. And one of the ways that um, uh, at the end of the, this presentation, I have a, a number of slides and I can hopefully send you a way to uh, send you a link for my smart phrase with a collection of videos, websites, and apps that patients can look at, review between visits with you or before they have a visit with Josh or myself. And sometimes that can make all the difference in how they think about their pain. So when they come to see me, typically this is what they're expecting. And it says basically, you're not crazy. You want crazy? I'll show you crazy. And in, in fact, the patients we see are not crazy. We don't see patients who have been diagnosed as crazy. We see patients who may say that their pain is driving them crazy. And we see patients uh, who may be driving other people crazy because of their pain, but they're not crazy. So when they come to my office, what they typically say to start, they walk in and they see a collection of uh, certificates, diplomas, and they say, okay, this guy, he's probably competent. He's probably going to take this seriously. And then as they look around in my office, they begin to notice these jars, one of which is behind me. I think this one is magic. They see these jars and they start seeing them smile or used to see them smile. Uh, they may chuckle, they may laugh. It lightens the mood a little. It breaks the ice. And they begin to realize, you know what? Maybe I can talk to this guy. And it's not your typical, quote, shrink office. So when your patient starts having low back pain, you may see them and say, you know what, this looks like ordinary strained muscle low back pain, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, my patient's probably deconditioned, uh, the patient may be a little overweight, uh, you know that your patient's stressed out. But overall, you believe, you know, this pain is gonna resolve, it's gonna get better, the patient's gonna be fine. But for many patients, when they start to have low back pain, they'll be thinking to themselves something like, ah, oh, I heard a pop I felt a pop in my back. That that can't be good. Uh oh. Or they'll be thinking to themselves, ah, oh, back pain. And you know, my father had low back pain, and, and boy, was he a he was a grouch. He was grumpy. He was on the couch all day. I don't want to be like that. Or they may think to themselves, you know, I had a I had a good friend who had low back pain, and and boy, he ended up having to have surgery, and then. He became disabled and he can't go to work and uh, he has no real family around him anymore and on and on. Or the patient may say, you know, every time I move it, I hurt. I got to lie down. I can't move. I can't move ever. 
So this may be going on in their minds. And then when their back pain persists for maybe weeks, could even be months, and you say, okay, we'll do some imaging, and you, you do, let's say, an x-ray, and you look on, and you say, yeah, looks like a pretty normal, healthy spine. I'm not worried. Your patient, however, is imagining the worst. Your patient is now beginning to think, uh-oh, I'm going to have to have surgery. So what's on their mind and what's on your mind may be very different. So at this point, what comes to mind is a, a quote from uh, Sir William Osler, which I, I favor a lot uh, in thinking from a behavioral medicine standpoint. It is more important to know what kind of person has the disease than the kind of disease the person has. And that's important because what I'm going to be interested in learning about and hopefully you'll have a chance with your patients to do the same is to figure out what else might be contributing to this patient's pain issue or what might be getting in their way of getting better and the patient may be struggling with something like fear avoidance where they begin to feel like if i move i'm going to have more pain or worse they begin to be fearful of, if I move, I'm going to do some damage to my spine. That's what it feels like. Uh, your patient may be beginning to catastrophize. They may be saying to themselves, oh my God, this pain is not going away. I think it's getting worse. Uh, my job is going to suffer. I may lose my job. How am I going to support my family? Uh, my family is going to just fall apart and on and on and on. Your patient may also have a backdrop of a PTSD, a major depression, an anxiety condition, uh, generalizing anxiety disorder, uh, panic disorder. They may have that comorbid, maybe premorbid. Um, some of your patients may have a tendency to somaticize. Uh, they may be kind of hypervigilant to anything sensory going on in the body. Uh, they begin to think there's something that's wrong that's being missed. They Google all their symptoms. They get more worried. Some patients have a backdrop of, of problems at work. They're not happy with their job. They're underemployed. They've been out of work because of COVID. Uh, they may be on a workers' compensation now. That's important to to pay attention to. Uh, there may be marital family issues, conflict, tension, uh, something they haven't talked about with anybody. Uh, there may be loss in their lives. Uh, it may be an anniversary of a loss of a, of a child, loss of a parent. Uh, they may have lost some of their self-esteem because they can't do what they love to do. That's gratifying. There may be a loss that they're anticipating. They're about to retire, sell their family home. These are all very important factors that can influence a person's pain experience. And I'm going to ask about, hopefully you will as well. And you can ask probably in the same way that I will approach patients. Um, so what worries you the most about your pain? What are you afraid of? What, what are you afraid will happen if you become more mobile, more active, if you do more? Uh, how is your pain beginning to affect uh, your work, your spouse, your family, your friends? Uh, is your sleep being affected by your pain? Have you noticed yourself becoming absorbed with thinking only about your pain? Have you noticed yourself becoming more irritable? nervous, discouraged, restless, sad. And I don't use words like, are you more anxious? I don't use words like, are you depressed? Um, I try to stay away from language that uh, elicits in people's minds this notion of, oh, you think it's psychiatric. So I use phrases and words that they can relate to. Yeah, I am sad and I am frustrated. 
and I am nervous. And they can talk more easily about those emotions. And of course, I'm going to look in the chart to see if they have a history of trauma, loss, substance use disorder, uh, major depression, anxiety. So if you ask these questions and you're thinking about making a referral, having answers from the patients about their sleep problems, their mood problems, uh, problems with relationships, with their fear of what's going to happen, it becomes easier to do the next. And that's making a referral. There are four key principles in making a successful referral for a behavioral medicine consultation, which is probably different than other medical consultations. Because again, patients are very suspect of why are they referring me to see a, a psychologist? The pain is not in my head. So you want to communicate a credible explanation for why. You want to make sure you acknowledge the legitimacy of their pain. You want to personalize, if possible, the consultation. And you want to reassure the patient that this is not abandoning them. So you can say something like, you know, it's been weeks now or months. We've been doing this medications and exercise and physical therapy. Is it helping? And if they say no, then you say, well, let's think about adding yet another service, some more expertise on helping you with your, your back pain. Uh, if they've complained about their mood or their sleep or they don't feel like they're coping, you can say, look, this may help with your mood. Uh, talking to this uh, behavioral medicine specialist could help you with your sleep, help you learn how to cope. Uh, you're going to be saying something to the effect of your symptoms are not psychological. They're not imaginary. I believe you. You have pain. But in my experience, in my practice, uh, many of my patients often say they want help with sleeping better so they can cope better. Uh, they want help. Uh, with coping with their pain. Ideally, if you've had some referrals to, to myself or my colleagues in the past, if it's worked out, you make reference to that. You know, Dr. Wickar has helped many of my patients with how to such and such. Um, or you might say, I have colleagues who have made referrals to uh, behavioral medicine. It's been very helpful to their patients. So patients want to know that you know something about the practice. And then importantly, you'll say something like, so I'm going to continue to, to follow you, to treat you for your, your back pain. Uh, Dr. Whitcower may be a, another member of your treatment team, but I'm still going to quarterback your care. What happens when patients come for behavioral medicine consultation and treatment, um, they're going to have an opportunity to learn how to uh, develop cognitive behavioral coping strategies for pain. They're going to learn how to, to sleep better, socialize more, be active, stay calm, work despite their, their pain. They're going to hopefully learn how to shift their focus from getting fixed, getting the pain totally resolved, which may not happen, or they may learn self-management approaches, and importantly, they may move on to, to life engagement. They start living their life again as, as opposed to existing with pain. Uh, and they may also learn what else in their lives um, hurt, what else might be contributing to their, their pain, such as grief, fear, trauma, and such. And they'll learn all of this, get help with this through some individual visits with myself and, and uh, Josh, uh, group sessions, some are open-ended, some are time-limited. We do acceptance commitments therapy, ACT. We do cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. We do mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. 
Uh, we do a mindfulness and stress management approach with some patients, and we do supportive expressive therapies. But, not but, and what is unique to the New Wellesley's spine and pain management services is that the behavioral medicine component is offering something that the other spine pain services in this area, Boston, don't offer. And that is group therapy. And if you have an opportunity to, to kind of inquire with your patients, uh, if they want to learn how to cope with their pain, uh, you can ask them, have they ever wanted to talk to other patients about their pain and how to cope? Uh, did they ever feel alone or isolated because of their pain problem? Have they ever felt that they needed more support in coping with their pain? Because group therapy is unique, it's special, it's powerful, and patients have said to me time and time again, gee, doc, what do you know about pain? And when they talk to another patient, that patient has a lot more credibility with understanding what pain feels like, how it's affected their lives, and what they can do about it. So we offer four uh, ongoing groups of up to eight patients. They're all virtual now, but um, three of them will go in person, hopefully, maybe by the fall. We'll see, uh, one will remain virtual. Uh, and in these long-term groups, patients um, appreciate that they can see other patients like themselves who are struggling to get better. Uh, they model for each other how to cope, how to suffer less. Uh, they support each other during difficult pain-related times with surgeries or injections uh, or interactions with family. And they inspire each other to want more in their lives, to do more in their lives. And so successful patients tend to leave group because they've gotten jobs, they've gotten too busy with their grandkids, they're starting to, to take vacations, uh, they're beginning to live their lives despite what they have. Now the time limit skills-based groups, uh, those meet um, for about six sessions every other week. Those will be starting uh, this fall. And they'll probably start virtually. Uh, and in those groups, patients will learn uh, behavioral coping strategies, uh, progressive muscle relaxation, uh, breathing exercises, activity pacing, uh, they'll learn cognitive strategies for coping, imagery, mindfulness, uh, cognitive re reappraisal, uh, goal setting. And they also benefit from the support from the group members and from accountability of saying, okay, you say you want to get better, are you doing what we're teaching you? So I just wanted to kind of emphasize that group therapy in particular is something that if you have a chance to talk about with your patients, uh, introduce them to, it's, it's really going to be very beneficial. So again, being mindful of the time and wanting to make sure I leave time for questions. Uh, our services are part of the uh, spine and pain management services in Wells Avenue. This is how you get a hold of us and make referrals. Uh, there's two of us currently, and hopefully we'll be expanding our, our services. And to keep in mind um, that a behavioral medicine approach may not uh, be just what we do. It may actually be sufficient if you start asking questions and inviting patients to talk about their fears, their beliefs, and their expectations about their pain. And if you can help them understand a little bit about this interaction between mood, uh, sleep, relationships, um, and pain, and you can do this by giving patients uh, the handouts, the videos, the websites, uh, and I'll be showing you a sample of those in a moment. But at the end, in this cartoon, you're just fine. This prescription is for me. 
these are some of the uh, pain resources we offer our patients. Um, and again, I have a, a smart phrase if, if folks would like to, to have that. We can probably find a way, uh, John, to maybe help distribute this. Um, there's a whole bunch of videos. Some are long, some are an hour and a half. Some are like only five minutes, eight minutes. We have uh, patient stories, websites. Curable is one of the most popular websites for low back pain. Books and workbooks for patients to use. And some patients will use these workbooks and say, thanks doc, I really don't need to meet with you. Because for some patients, it's, it's a real nuisance to have to even come in for a visit or schedule a visit. And they'd rather do this on their own. There's a bunch of apps that patients uh, have found helpful. And at this point, I'm going to stop that and invite questions. John? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. If anyone has any questions, you can throw in the chat box. Um, when you, uh, that's, those are great resources. Um, I can. Um, if you have a smart phrase and you want to send it to me and, and it's shareable, people can steal it. That'd be great. And we can get sure. that out to folks if they want. They can just, e you can email me. Um, when you talked about the group therapy, um, it reminded me us of our balance group that we do, Alan. So oh. <laughs> the faculty balance group for any position that is open, that meets once a month. We've been on Zoom for, you know, for the last 15 months, like everything else. But that's a great way for one of our wellness programs as well. So if that's an interest to you, um, if you have any questions about the balance group, or if you don't know what that is, please feel free to email me as well. Mm -hmm. um, one question I did have about in the last three minutes, do if we send our patients to the spine center, do they sometimes get referred into the groups or is it mandatory that they go to the groups if they continue there? Like, how does that work? The groups are, are optional. Um, typically, uh, patients will get referred and they'll be curious about the groups. I had two patients today who, who asked me about groups. Um, no, we talk with group, uh, patients about the groups to see what would be a, be a better fit. But if group isn't a good fit for them, then we'll meet with them individually. And your typical referral, does it come from the PCP mostly or does it come um, from one of your spine specialists? The last time um, I did a review of the referrals, um, I'd say... Uh, 15, 20% are coming from primary care physicians. Uh, the bulk are coming from pain and spine. And then another uh, 15, 20% from our, our rehab staff. Great. Well, Alan, thanks again for doing this. I hope sure. everyone has a, a Yeah, everyone has a great weekend. I'll get those resources out if you just let me know if you'd like them. And I'll get them straight from Alan. I'll definitely grab that smart phrase from you because I will use it for exactly. my patients. And once again, this talk will be up on, on the web and on our intranet. If you want to go ahead and grab it, you can grab the resources right off of that as well. Thanks again, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Yeah, bye.